Hey there, Selena here. I'm actually coming to you live from my local shopping centre. Wow, haven't done this one for quite some time. In fact, the only reason I'm even doing this is because I've just been to the dentist. But I am committed to consistency and consistency means being here on Wednesday at 12.30 to talk to you live. Now, I have not a lot repaired. I literally just have scribbled some stuff down on this piece of paper because I've just been to the dentist, as I said, and he was great. So I wanted to talk about um, what you could do to actually make a good store into a great store because there's a good chance that your store is good, right? You put the effort in, you put the time in, you've got great products, you've probably got great stuff, but what changes it to a great store? So I thought I'd jot down 10 things that you can do to turn your store from good into great. And you can do all these things that don't cost any money. Let's get into them. First of all is number one, know what your customers like. Hi Melinda. You know, this is really important and it seems, you know, it seems super obvious. Know what your customers want. But many retailers, when I ask them, you know, what are your top selling products? They rattle them off off the top of their head and I say, right, so how many units did you sell? Are you sure that that's actually the top product or the top category? And the funny thing is, when they go into their point of sale system, they actually find out that there are other products that beat the products that are in their head to the, you know, to the top of the race, to the top of the list. So know what your customers like and use that for your product inventory. Okay, I'm looking a little bit disheveled here, I know. Bear with me. Number two, have a team that takes responsibility. Now this is actually inspired from the dentist because this is the second dentist I've been to because the first one took no responsibility. Now, what do I mean by that? Again, it sounds super obvious. You should have a team that takes responsibility for their actions. But let me ask you, if you've got people who work for you, whether they're freelancers, whether they're people that you outsource work to, whether they're people in your own store, do they accept responsibility? So if we're talking in your own store, uh, if something goes wrong, if a customer makes a complaint, what happens? If your team accept responsibility, accept the fact that they stuffed up and maybe they didn't communicate well, maybe they sold them the wrong product, maybe they didn't listen, you know, if they accept that they made a mistake and they make an effort to fix it, they're the ones that you keep. They're the ones that you <clears throat> go to all the, you know, all the lengths of the earth to keep. But if you've got one of those people who will tell you it wasn't their fault, it was the point of sale system, it was all the customer, it was you know, the product, the supplier didn't get the thing in time. If they've got excuses for every time something goes wrong, have a think about whether they need some retraining because staff that accept responsibility are the ones that you want to keep because they're going to make your customers happy. They're going to go out of their way to ensure that your customers really love you know, what's happening at the end of the day. Okay, number three. Hang around with people who are growing their businesses. Oh my goodness, this is one that is dear to my heart. I am in a lot of Facebook groups. Like I, I hang in there, I, I find out what you're looking for, I create content to show you, you know, the answers to your questions. But this one is really, really important because social media has done something great. It's given us this chance to connect with people all over the world instantly. So if you've got a question, you can find someone to answer it instantaneously. But what it's also done is the opposite, is it's been able, it's made you be able to connect with people who aren't necessarily wanting the same things from their business that you are. So you've got to take action to get results, yeah? I think that's pretty obvious. So if you're hanging around, um, whether it's virtually or in real life with a bunch of people, especially business owners, who are telling you, you know, what a bad week they've had, what a bad month they've had, I urge you to start thinking, do you need to be in that group? Do you need to be hanging around with those people? Which brings me to number four. So whenever anybody, whether it's a client, whether it's just somebody in passing, whether it's a business owner that I'm meeting with, if they ever tell me that they're having a bad week or a bad month, the first thing I will ask is, so show me your plan. What was the plan for this month? Why did it go wrong? And I can guarantee you, they have no plan to show me, nothing. So number four is have a plan in place. Now you can do this through when we do the five day challenge that's coming up again in another few weeks. You know, having a plan in place on where you're going to be spending your marketing money, what you're going to be promoting, you know, what stock's coming through, what's going to be in your windows, what's going to be on the front page of your website, all those kinds of things. Have a plan in place and this is where you can be different from the big boys. You can actually pivot when something happens. You don't have a, a chain of command or a process or anything like that. If you can see that sales are down for the, you know, for the week, 
What are you doing about it? Are you sending out a newsletter? Are you running some Facebook ads? Are you promoting a product? What are you doing to turn it around? Because if the answer is nothing, if the answer is just showing up every single day and expecting that the people who walk through your door are gonna make a difference, then that's more for you and that is not being a business owner, that's just being a shopkeeper. And you know what I say, stop being a shopkeeper, start being a business owner. Okay, so number four was have a plan in place. Number five was to know your numbers and your cash flow. Uh, again, <laughs> something that so many business owners just don't do on a regular basis. You need to know the money that's coming in, you need to know the money that's going out, you need to know what's making you the money. You know, if you have money to do extra marketing, what, what's your, in fact, I'm gonna talk about that, number eight. But what are you gonna do with the money if you're having a good, week, a good month? What are you gonna do to <clears throat> make money? Sorry, I'm getting over the end of a sinus infection, so my voice is terribly croaky. Uh, what are you going to do to make money? What are you going to do to spend your money if there's any extra? You know, how much your wage is going to be? You need to know the money in your business. Get your head out of the sand and this is the thing you have to tackle. I personally hate doing it, but I make a date with myself once a month to know my numbers. Okay, number six. Do mini stock takes or regular stock takes or both in order to assess where your inventory is at. And this kind of ties back to um, having a plan and knowing your numbers, right? Because if you do a stock take and you can see that you've got some excess inventory, if you're doing a stock take once a month, which I know sounds like a flippin' heart attack, but if you did a mini stock take, if you just said, okay, I'm going to stock take accessories, or I'm going to stock take homewares, or I'm going to stock, stock take um, clothing between zero to two, you know, if you just pick a little group and do a mini stock take, then you can see where your inventory is at. And again, you can pivot. You can go back to having a plan in place, number four, and you can go back to number five, knowing your numbers. Because all of a sudden you'll be like, wow, I expected, you know, I order 20 of those a month and I expect to sell 15 of them. I still got 18 on the shelf. Okay, that is not a good thing. What are we gonna do to move this stock? And the answer is not have a sale, right? Okay, so number six was mini stock takes to control your inventory. Number seven from the very exciting um, receipt that I wrote this on is to have a spring clean. And this ties in again to you know the money, the inventory, all that kind of stuff. But a spring clean brings so much energy into your store. And if you've ever done a big spring clean, especially of your stock room, you'll know you find all these weird and wonderful things, one-offs, last offs, and all of a sudden you're like, oh wow, you know, either I could be getting rid of that and bringing some money in, Maybe you could do a promotion with it, maybe you could do a giveaway, maybe you could bundle it up with something else to get rid of it. But get the stuff out of your store that's not making any money. Keep it clean, <laughs> keep it clean, and bring a fresh energy in because when, when things are clean, when you've done that big spring clean, the energy that comes with it is just fabulous. And you'll feel it, and your customers will feel it, and your staff will certainly feel it too. So I'm getting a little bit blown away here. Okay, number seven was spring clean. Number eight is to measure your metrics. Again, so many people um, do advertising, they boost Facebook posts, Ugh, not a fan, but they boost Facebook posts and they don't measure their metrics. <clears throat> when it comes to traffic, um, when it comes to, com to sales, you've got two parts, right? Traffic and conversion. So knowing how much traffic you're getting from any marketing that you're doing and then knowing your conversions are two separate things and you need to analyze both of them because they will show you where the pitfall is. They will show you what is working and what's not. So if you're getting traffic to your website but no one's buying, the problem is your website. The problem is either the copy or the images or the page that you're sending them to. It could be a lot of things that you can analyze a little bit further. But if you're just getting no one clicking on your ads, your problem is traffic. So you know that you need to go and tweak the ads. But there is no point tweaking the ads if you're getting the traffic to the website. And if you are not measuring your metrics, you won't know this. You're gonna waste your money on marketing and advertising because you don't truly know, you don't truly understand where the problem is at. So number eight is to measure your metrics and your return on investment. Okay, number nine is it is time for you to be the go-to person in your industry. And so many people say, well, I can't because you know, I'm in the fashion industry or I just I run a homeware store. How can I be the go-to person? There's you know, a million homeware stores in Sydney, right? But what's your thing? Why did you start this business? Why, you know, what are you passionate about? You know, maybe it's something like origami. <clears throat> and whilst you might not sell it, 
be the go-to person that can incorporate that into your brand. Now, okay, these, these are the saturated markets where I p hear people say they can't be the go-to person. Fashion, homewares, baby and kids. Now, there's a lot of things in, every, yeah, there's literally millions of things in every single one of those niches that you could be great at, that you know a lot about or that you are passionate about. And just being aware that you are great at that thing, that you know an awful lot about that thing, being aware that, you know, when it shines through when you talk about it, people will come to you for that. People will, you know, and they'll buy other stuff as well. But if you are passionate about textiles or you're passionate about style or you're passionate about sustainability, being the go-to person in your niche, and that doesn't have to be the whole of the world or the whole of Australia or the whole of your state, it could just be in your local area. You know, you don't have to be the global leader. You can just be the local leader and that might be enough for you to get traffic into your store and onto your website. But if you don't know why you're doing this, if you don't know why your store is different to everybody else's, what you're great at, what you love, what you're passionate about, then why bother? Like, why, why are you in here? Why are you doing this? You know, is it making you money? Are you happy doing it? So I urge you to think about why you're doing what you're doing and how you can, you know, and what you love doing and how you can work that into your business in order to be the number nine, the go-to person in your area. And number 10, I have to flip over the page, is it is time to wrap my, I'm getting a little bit tired here. It is time to round up testimonials. Now testimonials make such a big difference to your business. Try and think outside the square though. So if you've got reviews on your website, fabulous start, but can you get a couple of video testimonials? Can you get um, you know, some audio testimonials? Can you get pictorial testimonials? Um, you know, fashion uses this really well when we're talking about how well things fit. So, you know, I'm a size 14, but how something fits me in my hourglass shape is completely different to how it will fit somebody, you know, my sister who has a completely different shape to me. So pictorial reviews, um, and, and fast fashion does this quite well. So take a leaf out of their book and try and use this in your business because rounding up reviews will get you more sales. It's social proof, it's guaranteed. The numbers are there, the metrics are there. You know, you will get more sales if you have the testimonials. But it's not just about written testimonials because they are so 2014. <laughs> Think different, you know, get a video testimonial, um, even like a written blog post. We sort of went away from those for quite some time and we went to short, short, short and sharp on the website or on the product page. Maybe going back to something like a blog post that has an in-depth review and it has pictures and it has maybe a couple of sound bites or videos. Those things are going to set you apart from your competition and those things are what are going to turn your good store into a great store. So let me just grab my bit of paper and quickly round up the 10 things that you can do to make your good store into a great store. Number one, know what your customers like. So this is talking about backing this up with the metrics out of your point of sale system. Number two, have a team that accepts responsibility. Number three, hang around with people who are growing their business, not people who are whinging about their business. And hey, if you want to do that, feel free to hit me up in the chat. We can talk about the boutique rock stars if you want to come and join them. Okay, number four, have a plan in place because if you don't have a plan in place, I've got no sympathy for you. If you don't have a plan in place on how you're going to market your business and make money and whether the downtimes, you know, there's always going to be months that are quiet. If you just expect that you're going to open the door and it's going to get better, I'm sorry. So number four is have a plan. Number five is know your numbers and your cash flow. So you kind of need number five in order to do number four, right? Number six is do your mini stock takes or, you know, some inventory um, control in order to see where you're at, to see what you need to be moving, what you need to be clearing out and what you need to be promoting. Number seven, spring clean, bring some energy in. Number eight, measure your metrics, know where your advertising is failing. Number nine, start to be the go-to person in your industry. And number 10, round up those testimonials in some way other than just a short, sharp review on your website. Okay, so if you're listening to this live, I'm about to jump off and we can continue this chat about the 10 things that make your good store into a great store. And if you're listening to this a little bit later on the podcast, feel free to hit the show notes, come over and talk about your opinions on what my 10 ways to make your good store into a great store are. But for now, have a fantastic week, be profitable, and I will see you next Wednesday at 12.30. Bye. 
This episode is brought to you by my new resource, The 5-Minute Hack to Make You a Copywriting Ninja. If you have an online store, then this is for you. It will show you exactly how you can update your product descriptions in order to make more sales. Download it for free at selenanight.com forward slash ninja.